This is a total damage capable by a snake bites hurting hurdle at level 1 on critical hit with little to no attack investment. And this is what it looks like with a total of 132% damage bonus and a level 15 hurting hurdle. To some people, that may not seem like a major number gap, but over the course of a match, the little details make all of the difference. This is a remastered version of a previous video covering stats, where the editing I find less polished and the use of text-to-speech made it more difficult to sit through. But as to make it less redundant, I've also decided to cover retakes today, to understand their purpose and when to preferably use them, so keep that in the back of your mind. So what are exactly stats, and how much of a difference do they make? Much like in any role-playing game, stats in Skullgirls Mobile are a share of values that increase specific aspects about a variant. There are two types of stats, basic and advanced, and all of them can be increased through equipping and leveling special moves and blockbusters. But the question here is, exactly what should I focus on in general? Are these stats more useful on this variant or not? Does Creed Resist have any use at all? All these questions and many more will be answered in what may be some of the most relevant information in the game. So let's get to it. Oh, that's that good shit. Basic stats are arguably the two most valuable assets to invest into, these being attack and health. Obviously attack is for dispatching opponents faster, while health is to turn your variants much more durable to damage. Depending on whether you're aiming for an offensive or defensive set, either attack or health are a must-have when it comes to investment, due to contributing to the most simple but necessary task on the respective fields. However, while it's cut clear that attack is for offense and health is for defense, there's the occasional exception that can use a role reversal, primarily health being used by attackers as means of taking less reflect damage. Each character has an established guideline for attack and health distribution, and within every character, each variant has a set of base stats for both of them, bronzes having the lowest and diamonds having the highest. This is important because it will usually determine a baseline for which role they would fulfill. That being said, there's a lot more factors that come into the mix, such as abilities, marquees, catalysts, for instance, Painwheel has the lowest base health in the entire game, and normally that would make her a poor choice for defense. But because she has multiple great reflect damage sources, she fits the bill regardless. Conversely, Eliza possesses good base health, but almost none of her variants can be classified as efficient defenders. Even still, said health is invested in some cases anyway as means of countering Painwheel's reflect damage. Of course, all of this revolves around health. Attack, thankfully, is a lot easier to understand. It's destined to attackers, and that's that. It's rarely ever going to be effective under the hands of a defender. With the two main stats under our belt, what else is out there that we should consider? Outside of the two primary stacks in attack and health, there's a list of secondary values, known as advanced stats. This can range from straightforward to understand, to confusing and or convoluted, as well as from high priority to low importance. And we'll go through each one discussing their purpose and whether should you invest on them or not. Piercing is undoubtedly the second most important stat in regards to offense. It allows the user to ignore a set percentage of defense value and armor, making it invaluable for much faster kills. Not carrying piercing will lead to timeout instances more frequently. More often than not, you should aim to max out piercing, but a value around 30% or higher can usually suffice. Conversely, defense becomes the opposite of piercing, where it's invaluable for defenses to last for as long as possible. And without it, your defenders are more likely to stay on the field for less time. Some people may argue that defense is bigger priority than health, but in reality, both are just as necessary. In some cases, health edges out defense by a mile, such as the case with pain will on rift battles, but normally you want to aim for both. Accuracy is a bit of a strange case, being extra effective for some variants and useless for others. Its primary function is to increase the odds of activating a percentage-based ability. 
To prevent any confusion as to how it works, it takes the original percentage value, subtracts the total accuracy percentage from it, and then adds that value to the original. Furthermore, another one of accuracy's roles is working as a resistance counter, meaning it reinforces the chances of a variance debuffs of inflicting. As such, the easy way of figuring out whether if it's worth investing accuracy is by checking if they have a useful percentage based ability, or if they have debuffs that could be deemed crucial to inflict. Much like how defense is a foil to piercing, resistance is a foil to accuracy. Like the name would imply, it has a set percentage of odds to resist any incoming debuff. Unlike accuracy, this stat has a concrete role on defense only, rarely ever seen on attack. The reason behind this is due to offense having an easier time deploying immunity, and match modifiers being unaffected by resistance. Element bonus and penalties serve as nothing more than extra damage for whenever you're either at element advantage or disadvantage. Penalty is objectively the least useful, due to only being applied to 3 elements out of 6, and because you're only compensating for a damage loss more than anything. As a result, it's heavily discouraged on the majority of situations. Bonus, on the other hand, can be put to good use. It applies to every element excepting neutral, and it adds extra damage to a pre-existing damage increase. It's at its best under the hands of air, light and dark variants due to the frequency of defenders of the element they're strong against. And it's also good for double, who can change element at will and increase element bonus damage even further with prestige, if not with underwhelming results. Tag and special cooldown are mechanically similar, but fill different roles. Tag cooldown focuses on speeding up the time a variant has to wait on the bench. It has its share of uses, but isn't commonly invested, due to being mostly favorable on tag-based variants like inner pieces and not much else. For all intents and purposes, carrying a rerun fulfills tag cooldown's role at a cheap price, though at the cost of a fighter slot in your team. Special cooldown, on the other hand, is very useful. As you could have guessed, it speeds up the reload time of special moves, leading to faster reuse. This is integral for keeping the opponent under control, such as spamming beams with Robo Fortune, Weight of Anubis with Eliza, or Wolf Shoot with Beowulf. Block proficiency is, in theory, a more offense-oriented version of defense. It reduces the damage taken when blocking, capable of nullifying it entirely at 100%. On paper it's great, not having to worry about taking any damage. Hell, you could argue it could fill niches for the purpose of keeping as many health points as possible in rifts. In execution, it's a much different story. Investing on a different stat outside of attack or health for a total 100% means you'll have to deprioritize a lot of also potentially relevant assets, just for one stat. A stat that in most cases gets overshadowed by recovery. It's a seemingly decent stat, but requires far too much effort and investment. Meter gain is basic and effective for both sides. All it does is increase the total meter that blockbusters get when either party lands a hit. On defense, it's always useful for a fast tier 3 charge. On offense, it depends on what blockbusters you're using. Carrying only tier 1s makes meter a bit excessive. With tier 2s, it's advisable, and with a tier 3, it's recommended. It's fair to consider that high meter gain may lead to a faster activation of Blockbuster, so be careful. Also, haste characters have little to no need for meter gain, as the buff itself grants 100% of it. Critical hits usually deal extra damage over regular hits, and normally they have moderate odds and damage increase, but these can be altered. Crit rate increases the chances for criticals, while crit damage boosts the total output of them. Investing both at the same time is the most favorable, but crit rate usually wins out because of its frequency on signature abilities. Although if a character or variant uses precision and doesn't involve critical hits for activation, then crit damage is far more preferable. Not to mention, if a variant has access to deathmark, then either of the two can help out, even if it doesn't contribute to the ability. Of course, criticals are the most present on offense, therefore these two stats are used for offense. Defense, on the other hand, gets crit resist, and last time I explained it like this. <laughs> Tempted as I am to repeat that bit, I'll actually explain why it's not that good. While it slows down crit based variants, it's not as effective as defense or resistance, and even if you were to fully invest into crit resist, precision can work around that. Furthermore, characters such as Painwheel and Black Dahlia would be much less efficient with it equipped, as such due to all this, I cannot advise it.
Now that we've explained how stats work and where to place them, we have to ask ourselves how to place them. Every move contains a series of stats attached to them. One for bronze, two for silver, and three for gold. When leveling up a move, one of the stats will go up by 1, 2, and 3% respectively. But on silver and gold moves, it will be randomized. Obviously, the stats attached to the move are also out of your control initially. So when getting a move, you should consider these following steps before you decide to make a heavy investment. Step 1. Must include attack percent or HP percent. As I explained earlier, attack and health are very integral stats for a variant, since they allow them to hit harder or stall for longer. Therefore, when looking for moves, make sure you find attack percent or HP percent. I have to reiterate that it needs to be the version with a percentage on it. The game features a percentage-based core stat and a flat core stat. Always go for the percentage-based. The increase of invested attack or health between one and the other is immediately apparent. As such, avoid flat stats as much as possible. Step 2. Consider what advanced stats you need. Once you have your core stat placed, you then want to see if the advanced stats are any useful. The following chart displays what you usually want to aim for. Since every move in a set wants either attack or health, they should be treated as core stats. The rest should be flexible to overcapping, which I'll get into later. To quickly skim over a few of them, Offense usually wants piercing and special cooldown, and defense desires defense and resistance. However, something like block proficiency may have its moments but rarely comes into play, and there's barely any usefulness in any side for element penalty. Crit rate and damage technically work for most attackers, but it's best profited by those revolving around criticals. As for accuracy, it's heavily reliant on what characters or variants use it. For example, most Robo Fortunes don't require it, because of their debuffs either applying regularly, or they just don't have chance-based abilities. Philia, on the other hand, benefits a fair share from it, thanks to most of them featuring chance-based abilities, and a common debuff in Bleed that has fair interest in being inflicted. Step 3. Mind the risk of overcapping. While there is a set of stats placed in very high, it shouldn't be synonymous with exclusively equipping those, as you'll eventually run with the probability of overcapping a stat. With the exception of attack and health, every stat has a set limit of how far it can go. Most of them go up to 50%, while some cases get to 100, and there's exceptions like element penalty at 0 and crit damage at 200. If you see any value close to its respective cap, you might prefer to switch it for a different stat. For instance, say your peacock set displays a piercing of 50%, but in reality you have up to 61. You should replace a few moves with others that do not feature piercing, and ideally remain close to 50%. But now we are presented a second option. Retakes have been added recently, along with patch 5.2. It's the closest we have for direct agency regarding a move's stats, and for good reason it's been a long time requested feature. By selecting the reroll option, you're taken to a menu where you get to choose which stat you'd like to replace. You have to spend a retake in order to execute the transaction, and once done, the game will display a new randomly chosen stat for you, to whether replace for the old one, or reject it and keep the move on its previous state. Keep in mind that regardless of this last choice, your retake will remain spent, and they're sparse. The best use for retakes is when you have a move that got too many rolls on the wrong stat, like say 3 attack rolls and 8 meter gain ones. You can switch them around by replacing attack for something else, meter gain for attack, and that third stat for meter gain. That makes it sound simple, but it can get ridiculously tricky and expensive if luck is not on your side. This is why some people have started taking the practice of deliberately taking a terrible move, and if it gets a noticeably large number of rolls into one specific stat, re-roll it into attack or health, and everything else into other desirable stats. It can remove a few minimum retakes, but because it's RNG, it can still cost you a pretty penny. Here's an interesting psychological trick. Have one of the stats to retake be a flat stat. This way, when re-rolling, you effectively removed it from the possible new stats, and it prevents you a bit of visual frustration. It's not much and realistically does nothing, but it can help some people. The one instance where it's not advisable to use them on is for level 1 moves to turn them into perfect ones. The ideal purpose for retakes is to correct a mistake from a considerable investment into something much more usable. You'd be wasting them if you choose to re-roll a level 1, because you don't know if it's going to roll good or not. Additionally, even with the presence of retakes, you should still look for perfect moves anyway, so you can minimize your total investments. Should I prioritize stats or the move itself? 
Despite what we have discussed about ideal stats today, you still want to prioritize first and foremost having the move itself in the first place. Say you have a filiotaunt and a ringlet spike. Normally the latter would be the best choice, right? Now suppose the taunt has perfect stats and ringlet spike has nothing of value. Which one should you go for? The answer is still the latter case. For the simple reason of the move itself being far more useful and with the addition of retakes, you could patch it into a perfect move. But then another question arises. What moves would every character use? Answering this question for every character would take a long while. On offense, you want to have a balance between blockbusters and special moves having two of one type and three of the other. Some moves that characters enjoy would be Ringlet Spike for Philia, Dragon Punch for Squiggly, Chaos Banish for Eliza, Phaser Burner for Robo Fortune, and Egret Call for Parasol, just to name a few. On defense, make sure to always equip at least one burst and the character's tier 3 blockbuster. Does Dead Eye replace piercing? For context, Dead Eye is the newly introduced buff that came out alongside Black Dahlia. One of its effects is to ignore the opponent's defense. Does that mean it overtakes Piercing's job? Well, yes and no. You can perfectly run a full Dead Eye build with the right moves, abilities, or Dahlia's prestige. But having Piercing into the mix can be of help for a faster execution, and in case you get cursed midway and things go south. Is it worth to invest in bronze and silver moves? Not really. Bronze moves are only convenient to test out effects at a cheap price. But that's it. They will age horribly when you get to higher levels and start getting better moves. Silvers, however, are occasionally invested as means of only having two very specific stats. It's not something I personally practice, but it has worked for a couple of people, so it's not entirely worthless. I will say though, retakes have made that tactic rather obsolete, so consider it wisely. And that's all there is to stats, folks. This is usually both a complex matter, but an incredibly relevant one at the same time. So it's pretty common for people to ask themselves whether to invest in one move or not. Hopefully this updated guide was of help, be it as an easy reference or for eventually being able to decide on your own. With that said, thanks for watching and... I don't know, maybe I'll do a video on the 5.3 patch.